Lot 27, play on people's need to believe to create a cult-like following. Judgment, people have an overwhelming desire to believe in something. Become the focal point of such desire by offering them a cuz, a new faith to follow. Keep your words vague but full of promise. Emphasize enthusiasm over rationality and clear thinking. Give your new disciples rituals to perform and ask them to make sacrifices on your behalf. In the absence of organized religion and grand causes, your new belief system will bring you untold power. The Science of Charlatanism, or How to Create a Cult in Five Easy Steps, in searching as you must for the methods that will gain you the most power for the least effort, you will find the creation of a cult-like following one of the most effective. Having a large following opens up all sorts of possibilities for deception. Not only will your followers worship you, but they will also defend you from your enemies and will voluntarily take on the work of enticing others to join your fledgling cult. This kind of power will lift you to another realm. You will no longer have to struggle or use deception to enforce your will. You are adored and can do no wrong. You might think it a huge task to create such a following, but it is fairly simple. As humans, we desperately need to believe in something, anything. This makes us eminently gullible, we simply cannot endure long periods of doubt or the emptiness that comes from a lack of something to believe in. Dangle in front of us some new cuz, elixir, get rich quick scheme, or the latest technological trend or art movement, and we leap from the water as one to take the bait. Look at history, the chronicles of the new trends and cults that have made a mass following for themselves could fill a library. After a few centuries, a few decades, a few years, a few months, they generally look ridiculous, but at the time they seem so attractive, so transcendental, so divine. Always in a rush to believe in something, we will manufacture saints and faiths out of nothing. Do not let this gullibility go to waste. Make yourself the object of worship. Make people form a cult around you. The great European charlatans of the 16th and 17th centuries mastered the art of quilt making. They lived, as we do now, in a time of transformation. Organized religion was on the wane, and science was on the rise. People were desperate to rally around a new cause or faith. The charlatans had begun by peddling health elixirs and alchemic shortcuts to wealth. Moving quickly from town to town, they originally focused on small groups until, by accident, they stumbled on a truth of human nature. The larger the group they gathered around themselves, the easier it was to deceive. The charlatan would station himself on a high wooden platform, hence the term mount a bank, and crowds would swarm around him. In a group setting, people were more emotional and less able to reason. Had the charlatan spoken to them individually, they might have found him ridiculous, but lost in a crowd, they got caught up in a communal mood of rapt attention. It became impossible for them to find the distance to be skeptical. Any deficiencies in the charlatan's ideas were hidden by the zeal of the masses. Passion and enthusiasm swept through the crowd like a contagion, and they reacted violently to anyone who dared to spread a seed of doubt. Both consciously studying this dynamic over decades of experiment and spontaneously adapting to these situations as they happened, the charlatans perfected the science of attracting and holding a crowd, molding the crowd into followers, and the followers into a cult. It was to the charlatans' advantage that the individuals predisposed to credulity should multiply, that the groups of his adherents should enlarge to mass proportions, guaranteeing an ever greater scope for his triumphs. This was in fact to occur as science was popularized from the Renaissance down through succeeding centuries. With the immense growth of knowledge and its spread through printing in modern times, the mass of the half-educated, the eagerly gullible prey of the quack, also increased and became indeed a majority. Real power could be based on their wishes, opinions, preferences, and rejections. The charlatan's empire accordingly widened with the modern dissemination of knowledge. Since he operated based on science, however much he perverted it, producing gold with a technique borrowed from chemistry and his wonderful balsams with the apparatus of medicine, he could not appeal to an entirely ignorant folk. The illiterate would be protected against his absurdities by their healthy common sense. His choicest audience would be composed of the semi-literate, those who had exchanged their common sense for a little distorted information and had encountered science and education at some time, though briefly and then successfully. The great mass of mankind has always been predisposed to marvel at mysteries, and this was especially true at certain historic periods when the secure foundations of life seemed shaken and old values, economic or spiritual, long accepted as certainties, could no longer be relied upon. Then the numbers of the charlatans dupes multiplied the self-killers, as a 17th century Englishman called them. The power of the charlatan, Greek D. Francesco, 1939, 
The gimmicks of the charlatans may seem quaint today, but there are thousands of charlatans among us still, using the same tried and true methods their predecessors refined centuries ago, only changing the names of their elixirs and modernizing the look of their cults. We find these latter-day charlatans in all arenas of life business, fashion, politics, and art. Many of them, perhaps, are following the charlatan tradition without having any knowledge of its history, but you can be more systematic and deliberate. Simply follow the five steps of quilt making that our charlatan ancestors perfected over the years. Step 1. Keep it vague. Keep it simple. To create a cult, you must first attract attention. This you should do not through actions, which are too clear and readable, but through words, which are hazy and deceptive. Your initial speeches, conversations, and interviews must include two elements. On the one hand, the promise of something great and transformative, and on the other, a total vagueness. This combination will stimulate all kinds of hazy dreams in your listeners, who will make their connections and see what they want to see. To make your vagueness attractive, use words of great resonance but cloudy meaning, words full of heat and enthusiasm. Fancy titles for simple things are helpful, as are the use of numbers and the creation of new words for vague concepts. All of these create the impression of specialized knowledge, giving you a veneer of profundity. By the same token, try to make the subject of your cult new and fresh, so that few will understand it. Done right, the combination of vague promises, cloudy but alluring concepts, and fiery enthusiasm will stir people's souls and a group will form around you. Talk too vaguely and you have no credibility. But it is more dangerous to be specific. If you explain in detail the benefits people will gain by following your cult, you will be expected to satisfy them. As a corollary to its vagueness, your appeal should also be simple. Most people's problems have complex causes, deep-rooted neurosis, interconnected social factors, and roots that go way back in time and are exceedingly hard to unravel. Few, however, have the patience to deal with this. Most people want to hear that a simple solution will cure their problems. The ability to offer this kind of solution will give you great power and build you a following. Instead of the complicated explanations of real life, return to the primitive solutions of our ancestors, to good old country remedies, to mysterious panaceas. Step 2. Emphasize the visual and the sensual over the intellectual. Once people have begun to gather around you, two dangers will present themselves, boredom and skepticism. Boredom will make people go elsewhere. Skepticism will allow them the distance to think rationally about whatever it is you are offering, blowing away the mist you have artfully created and revealing your ideas for what they are. You need to amuse the bored then and ward off the cynics. The OWHO is God. Once upon a starless midnight, there was an owl who sat on the branch of an oak tree. Two ground moles tried to slip quietly by unnoticed. You, said the owl, who? They quavered in fear and astonishment, for they could not believe anyone could see them in that thick darkness. You too, said the owl. The moles hurried away and told the other creatures of the field and forest that the owl was the greatest and wisest of all animals because he could see in the dark and because he could answer any question. I'll see about that, said a secretary bird, and he called on the owl one night when it was again very dark. How many claws am I holding up, said the secretary bird. Two, said the owl, and that was right. Can you give me another expression for that is to say or namely, asked the secretary bird. To wit, said the owl. Why does a lover call on his love, asked the secretary bird. To woo, said the owl. The secretary bird hastened back to the other creatures and reported that the owl was indeed the greatest and wisest animal in the world because he could see in the dark and because he could answer any question. Can he see in the daytime too, asked a red fox. Yes, echoed a dormouse and a French poodle. Can he see in the daytime too? All the other creatures laughed loudly at this silly question, and they set upon the red fox and his friends and drove them out of the region. Then they sent a messenger to the owl and asked him to be their leader. When the owl appeared among the animals, it was high noon, and the sun was shining brightly. He walked very slowly, which gave him an appearance of great dignity, and he peered about him with large, staring eyes, which gave him an air of tremendous importance. He's God, screamed a Plymouth rock hen, and the others took up the cry, He's God. So they followed him wherever he went, and when he began to bump into things, they began to bump into things, too. Finally, he came to a concrete highway, and he started up the middle of it, and all the other creatures followed him. Presently, a hawk, who was acting as an outrider, observed a truck coming toward them at 50 miles an hour, and he reported to the secretary bird, and the secretary bird reported to the owl. There's danger ahead, said the secretary bird. To wit, said the owl. The secretary birds told him, aren't you afraid? He asked, who, said the owl calmly, for he could not see the truck. He's God, 
cried all the creatures again, and they were still crying he's God. When the truck hit them and ran them down, some of the animals were merely injured, but most of them, including the owl, were killed. Moral, you can fool too many of the people too much of the time. The Thurber Carnival, James Thurber, 1894-1961, the best way to do this is through theater or other devices of its kind. Surround yourself with luxury, dazzle your followers with visual splendor, and fill their eyes with spectacle. Not only will this keep them from seeing the ridiculousness of your ideas and the holes in your belief system, but it will also attract more attention and more followers. Appeal to all the senses, use incense for scent, soothing music for hearing, and colorful charts and graphs for the eye. You might even tickle the mind perhaps by using new technological gadgets to give your cult a pseudo-scientific veneer as long as you do not make anyone think. Use the exotic distant cultures, strange customs to create theatrical effects, and to make the most banal and ordinary affairs seem signs of something extraordinary. Step 3. Borrow the forms of organized religion to structure the group. Your cult-like following is growing. It is time to organize it. Find a way to both elevate and comfort. Organized religions have long held and questioned authority for large numbers of people, and continue to do so in our supposedly secular age. And even if the religion itself has faded some, its forms still resonate with power. The lofty and holy associations of organized religion can be endlessly exploited. Create rituals for your followers. Organize them into a hierarchy, ranking them in grades of sanctity, and giving them names and titles that resound with religious overtones. Ask them for sacrifices that will fill your coffers and increase your power. To emphasize your gathering's quasi-religious nature, talk and act like a prophet. You are not a dictator after all. You are a priest, a guru, a sage, a shaman, or any other word that hides your real power in the midst of religion. Step 4. Disguise your source of income. Your group has grown and you have structured it in a church-like form. Your coffers are beginning to fill with your followers' money. Yet you must never be seen as hungry for money and the power it brings. It is at this moment that you must disguise the source of your income. Your followers want to believe that if they follow you all sorts of good things will fall into their lap. By surrounding yourself with luxury, you become living proof of the soundness of your belief system. Never reveal that your wealth comes from your followers' pockets. Instead, make it seem to come from the truth of your methods. Followers will copy your every move in the belief that it will bring them the same results and their imitative enthusiasm will blind them to the charlatan nature of your wealth. Step 5. Set up an us versus them dynamic. The group is now large and thriving, a magnet attracting more and more particles. If you are not careful though, inertia will set in and time and boredom will demagnetize the group. To keep your followers united, you must now do what all religions and belief systems have done. Create an us versus them dynamic. First, make sure your followers believe they are part of an exclusive club, unified by a bond of common goals. Then, to strengthen this bond, manufacture the notion of a devious enemy out to ruin you. There is a force of non-believers that will do anything to stop you. Any outsider who tries to reveal the charlatan nature of your belief system can now be described as a member of this devious force. If you have no enemies, invent one. Given a straw man to react against, your followers will tighten and cohere. They have your cause to believe in and infidels to destroy. Observances of a Law Observance 1. In the year 1653, a 27-year-old Milan man named Francesco Giuseppe Bori claimed to have had a vision. He went around town telling one and all that the Archangel Michael had appeared to him and announced that he had been chosen to be the Capitano General of the Army of the New Pope, an army that would seize and revitalize the world. The archangel had further revealed that Bori now had the power to see people's souls and that he would soon discover the philosopher's stone a long sought after substance that could change base metals into gold. Friends and acquaintances who heard him explain the vision and who witnessed the change that had come over him were impressed for Bori had previously devoted himself to a life of wine, women, and gambling. Now he gave all that up, plunging himself into the study of alchemy and talking only of mysticism and the occult. The transformation was so sudden and miraculous, and Bori's words were so filled with enthusiasm that he began to create a following. Unfortunately, the Italian Inquisition began to notice him as well. They prosecuted anyone who delved into the occult, so he left Italy and began to wander Europe from Austria to Holland, telling one and all that to those who follow me all joy shall be granted. Wherever Bar stayed he attracted followers. His method was simple. He spoke of his vision, which had grown more and more elaborate, and offered to look into the soul of anyone who believed him, and there were many, seemingly in a trance. 
he would stare at this new follower for several minutes, then claim to have seen the person's soul, degree of enlightenment, and potential for spiritual greatness. If what he saw showed promise, he would add the person to his growing order of disciples, an honor indeed. The cult had six degrees, into which the disciples were assigned according to what Bori had glimpsed in their souls. With work and total devotion to the cult, they could graduate to a higher degree. Bori, whom they called His Excellency and Universal Doctor, demanded from them the strictest vows of poverty. All the goods and money they possessed had to be turned over to him. But they did not mind handing over their property, for Bori had told them, I shall soon bring my chemical studies to a happy conclusion by the discovery of the Philosopher's Stone, and by this means we shall all have as much gold as we desire. Given his growing wealth, Bori began to change his style of living. Renting the most splendid apartment in the city into which he had temporarily settled, he would furnish it with fabulous furniture and accessories, which he had begun to collect. He would drive through the city in a coach studded with jewels, with six magnificent black horses at its head. He never stayed too long in one place, and when he disappeared, saying he had more souls to gather into his flock, his reputation only grew in his absence. He became famous, although he had never done a single concrete thing. To become the founder of a new religion, one must be psychologically infallible in one's knowledge of a certain average type of souls who have not yet recognized that they belong together. Friedrich Nietzsche, 1844 to 1900 men are so simple of mind and so much dominated by their immediate needs that a deceitful man will always find plenty who are ready to be deceived. Niccolo Machiavelli, 1469 to 1527 from all over Europe, the blind, the crippled, and the desperate came to visit Bori for word had spread that he had healing powers. He asked no fee for his services, which only made him seem more marvelous, and indeed some claimed that in this or that city, he had performed a miracle cure. By only hinting at his accomplishments, he encouraged people's imaginations to blow them up to fantastic proportions. His wealth, for example, actually came from the vast sums he was collecting from his increasingly select group of rich disciples. Yet it was presumed that he had perfected the philosopher's stone, the church continued to pursue him, denouncing him for heresy and witchcraft, and Bori's response to these charges was a dignified silence. This only enhanced his reputation and made his followers more passionate. Only the great are persecuted, after all. How many understood Jesus Christ in his own time? Bori did not have to say a word his followers now called the Pope the Antichrist. And so Bori's power grew and grew, until one day he left the city of Amsterdam, where he had settled for a while, absconding with huge sums of borrowed money and diamonds that had been entrusted to him. He claimed to be able to remove the flaws from diamonds through the power of his gifted mind. Now he was on the run. The Inquisition eventually caught up with him, and for the last 20 years of his life, he was imprisoned in Rome. But so great was the belief in his occult powers that to his dying day he was visited by wealthy believers, including Queen Christina of Sweden. Supplying him with money and materials, these visitors allowed him to continue his search for the elusive philosopher's stone. Interpretation The Temple of Health In the late 1780s, the Scottish quack James Graham was winning a large following and great riches in London. Graham maintained a show of great scientific technique. In 1772, he visited Philadelphia where he met Benjamin Franklin and became interested in the latter's experiments with electricity. These appear to have inspired the apparatus in the Temple of Health, the fabulous establishment he opened in London for the sale of his elixirs. In the chief room where received patients stood the largest air pump in the world to assist him in his philosophical investigations into disease, and also a stupendous metallic conductor, a richly gilded pedestal surrounded with retorts and vials of ethereal and other essences. According to J. Anna Moser, who published A History of Magic in 1844 at Leipzig, Graham's house, united the useful with the pleasurable. Everywhere the utmost magnificence was displayed. Even in the outer court, avert an eyewitness, it seemed as though art, invention, and riches had been exhausted. On the side walls of the chambers, an arc-shaped glow is provided by artificial electric light. Star rays darted forth. Transparent glasses of all colors were placed with clever selection and much taste. All this, the same eyewitness assures us, was ravishing and exalted the imagination to the highest degree. Visitors were given a printed sheet of rules for healthy living. In the great Apollo apartment, they might join in mysterious rituals accompanied by chants, hail, vital air, ethereal, magnetic magic, hail. And while they hailed the magic of magnetism, the windows were darkened, revealing a ceiling studded with electric stars and a young and lovely rosy goddess of health in a niche. 
Every evening, this temple of health was crowded with guests. It had become the fashion to visit it and try the great well-foot bed of state, the grand celestial bed, said to cure any disease. This bed, according to Tona Moser, stood in a splendid room into which a cylinder led from an adjoining chamber to conduct the healing currents. At the same time, all sorts of pleasing scents of strengthening herbs and oriental incense were also brought in through glass tubes. The heavenly bed itself rested upon six solid transparent pillars. The bedclothes were of purple and sky-blue atlas silk, spread over a mat saturated with Arabian-perfumed waters to suit the tastes of the Persian court. The chamber in which it was placed he called the Sanctum Sanctorum. To add to all this, there were the melodious notes of the harmonica, soft flutes, agreeable voices, and a great organ. The power of the charlatan Greek D. Francesco, 1939 before he formed his cult, Bori seems to have stumbled upon a critical discovery. Tiring of his life of debauchery, he had decided to give it up and devote himself to the occult, a genuine interest of his. He must have noticed, however, that when he alluded to a mystical experience, rather than physical exhaustion as the source of his conversion, people of all classes wanted to hear more. Realizing the power he could gain by ascribing the change to something external and mysterious, he went further with his manufactured visions. The grander the vision and the more sacrifices he asked for, the more appealing and believable his story seemed to become. Remember, people are not interested in the truth about change. They do not want to hear that it has come from hard work or anything as banal as exhaustion, boredom, or depression. They are dying to believe in something romantic or otherworldly. They want to hear of angels and out-of-body experiences. Indulge them. Hint at the mystical source of some personal change. Wrap it in ethereal colors. An occult-like following will form around you. Adapt to people's needs. The Messiah must mirror the desires of his followers. And always aim high. The bigger and bolder your illusion, the better. Observance too, in the mid-1700s, word spread in Europe's fashionable society of a Swiss country doctor named Michael Schapach who practiced a different kind of medicine. He used the healing powers of nature to perform miraculous cures. Soon well-to-do people from all over the continent, their ailments both serious and mild, were making the track to the alpine village of Lang now where Schapach lived and worked. Tridging through the mountains, these visitors witnessed the most dramatic natural landscapes that Europe has to offer. By the time they reached Lang now, they were already feeling transformed and on their way to health. Shuppik, who had become known as simply the mountain doctor, had a small pharmacy in town. This place became quite a scene. Crowds of people from many different countries would cram into the small room, its walls lined with colorful bottles filled with herbal cures. Where most doctors of the time prescribed foul-tasting concoctions that bore incomprehensible Latin titles, as medicines often do still, Shuppix cures had names such as the oil of joy, little flower's heart, or against the monster, and they tasted sweet and pleasing. Visitors to Lang now would have to wait patiently for a visit with the mountain doctor because every day some 80 messengers would arrive at the pharmacy bearing flasks of urine from all over Europe. Shuppix claimed he could diagnose what ailed you simply by looking at a sample of your urine and reading a written description of your ailment. Naturally, he read the description very carefully before prescribing a cure, when he finally had a spare minute, the urine samples took up much of his time. He would call the visitor into his office in the pharmacy. He would then examine this person's urine sample, explaining that its appearance would tell him everything he needed to know. Country people had a sense for these things. He would say their wisdom came from living a simple, godly life with none of the complications of urban living. This personal consultation would also include a discussion as to how one might bring one's soul more into harmony with nature. Shuppik had devised many forms of treatment, each profoundly unlike the usual medical practices of the time. He was a believer, for instance, in electric shock therapy. To those who wondered whether this was in keeping with his belief in the healing power of nature, he would explain that electricity is a natural phenomenon. He was merely imitating the power of lightning. One of his patients claimed to be inhabited by seven devils. The doctor cured him with electrical shocks, and as he administered these, he exclaimed that he could see the devils flying out of the man's body, one by one. Another man claimed to have wallowed a hay wagon and its driver, which were causing him massive pains in the chest. The mountain doctor listened patiently, claimed to be able to hear the crack of a whip in the man's belly, promised to cure him, and gave him a sedative and a purgative. The man fell asleep on a chair outside the pharmacy. As soon as he awoke he vomited, and as he vomited a hay wagon sped past him, the mountain doctor had hired it for the occasion, the crack of its whip making him feel that somehow he had indeed expelled under the doctor's care. Over the years, the mountain doctor's fame grew. 
He was consulted by the powerful even the right Urgata made the track to his village, and he became the center of a cult of nature in which everything natural was considered worthy of worship. Shupik was careful to create effects that would entertain and inspire his patients. A professor who visited him once wrote, One stand or sits in the company, one plays cards, sometimes with a young woman. Now a concert is given, now a lunch or supper, and now a little ballet is presented. With a very happy effect, the freedom of nature is everywhere united with the pleasures of the Beaumont, and if the doctor is not able to heal any diseases, he can at least cure hypochondria and the vapors. Interpretation Chupik had begun his career as an ordinary village doctor. He would sometimes use in his practice some of the village remedies he had grown up with, and apparently, he noticed some results, for soon these herbal tinctures and natural forms of healing became his specialty and his natural form of healing did have profound psychological effects on his patients. Where the normal drugs of the time created fear and pain, Shepik's treatments were comfortable and soothing. The resulting improvement in the patient's mood was a critical element in the cures he brought about. His patients believed so deeply in his skills that they willed themselves into health. Instead of scoffing at their irrational explanations for their ailments, Shepik used their hypochondria to make it seem that he had effected a great cure. The case of the mountain doctor teaches us valuable lessons in the creation of a cult-like following. First, you must find a way to engage people's will, to make their belief in your powers strong enough that they imagine all sorts of benefits. Their belief will have a self-fulfilling quality, but you must make sure that it is you, rather than their own will, who is seen as the agent of transformation. Find the belief, cause, or fantasy that will make them believe with a passion, and they will imagine the rest, worshipping you as a healer, prophet, genius, or whatever you like. Second, Shepik teaches us the everlasting power of belief in nature and simplicity. Nature, in reality, is full of much that is terrifying poisonous plants, fierce animals, sudden disasters, and plagues. Belief in the heal, and the comforting quality of nature is a constructed myth, a romanticism. But the appeal to nature can bring you great power, especially in complicated and stressful times. This appeal, however, must be handled right. Devise a kind of theater of nature in which you, as the director, pick and choose the qualities that fit the romanticism of the times. The mountain doctor played the part to perfection, playing up his home spin wisdom and wit, and staging his cures as dramatic pieces. He did not make himself one with nature. Instead, he molded nature into a cult, an artificial construction. To create a natural effect, you have to work hard, making nature theatrical and delightfully pagan. Otherwise, no one will notice. Nature too must follow trends and be progressive. Observance 3. In 1788, at the age of 55, the doctor and scientist Franz Mesmer was at a crossroads. He was a pioneer in the study of animal magnetism, the belief that animals contain magnetic matter, and that a doctor or specialist can effect miraculous cures by working on this charged substance, but in Vienna where he lived his theories had met with scorn and ridicule from the medical establishment. In treating women for convulsions, Mesmer claimed to have worked several cures, his proudest achievement being the restoration of sight to a blind girl. But another doctor who examined the young girl said she was as blind as ever, an assessment with which she agreed. Mesmer counted that his enemies were out to slander him by winning her over to their side. This claim only elicited more ridicule. Vesper minded Viennese were the wrong audience for his theories, and so he decided to move to Paris and start again. Renting a splendid apartment in his new city, Mesmer decorated it appropriately. Stained glass in most of the windows created a religious feeling, and mirrors on all the walls produced a hypnotic effect. The doctor advertised that in his apartment he would give demonstrations of the powers of animal magnetism, inviting the diseased and melancholic to feel its powers. Soon Parisians of all classes, but mostly women who seemed more attracted to the idea than men did, were paying for entry to witness the miracles that Mesmer promised. Inside the apartment, the scents of orange blossom and exotic incense wafted through special vents. As the initiates filtered into the salon where the demonstrations took place, they heard harp music and the lulling sounds of a female vocalist coming from another room. In the center of the salon was a long oval container filled with water that Mesmer claimed had been magnetized. From holes in the container's lid protruded long movable iron rods. The visitors were instructed to sit around the container, place these magnetized rods on the body part that gave them pains or problems and then hold hands with their neighbors, sitting as close as possible to one another to help the magnetic force pass between their bodies. Sometimes, too, they were attached by cords. The Poeroi, too, in the town of Tarnapal lived a man by the name of Reb Fivel. 
One day, as he sat in his house deeply absorbed in his Talmud, he heard a loud noise outside. When he went to the window, he saw a lot of little pranksters, up to some new piece of mischief, no doubt, he thought. Children, run quickly to the synagogue, he cried, leaning out and improvising the first story that occurred to him. You'll see there a sea monster, and what a monster. It's a creature with five feet, three eyes, and a beard like that of a goat, only it's green. And sure enough, the children scampered off and Reb Fibble returned to his studies. He smiled into his beard as he thought of the trick he had played on those little rascals. It wasn't long before his studies were interrupted again, this time by running footsteps. When he went to the window, he saw several Jews running. Where are you running? He called out. To the synagogue, answered the Jews. Haven't you heard? There's a sea monster. There's a creature with five legs, three eyes, and a beard like that of a goat. Only it's green. Reb Fevelod with glee, thinking of the trick he had played, and sat down again to his Talmud. But no sooner had he begun to concentrate when suddenly he heard a dining tumult outside. And what did he see? A great crowd of men, women, and children all ran toward the synagogue. What's up? He cried, sticking his head out of the window. What a question. Why, don't you know? They answered, right in front of the synagogue, there's a sea monster. It's a creature with five legs, three eyes, and a beard like that of a goat, only it's green. And as the crowd hurried by, Reb Fibble suddenly noticed that the rabbi himself was among them. Lord of the world, he exclaimed. If the rabbi himself is running with them, surely there must be something happening. Where there's smoke, there's fire. Without further thought, Reb Fibble grabbed his hat, left his house, and also began running. Who can tell? He muttered to himself as he ran, all out of breath, toward the synagogue, a treasury of Jewish folklore. Nathan Ausubel, ed. 1948 Mesmer would leave the room, and assistant magnetizers, all handsome and strapping young men, would enter with jars of magnetized water that they would sprinkle on the patients, rubbing the healing fluid on their bodies, massaging it into their skin, moving them toward a trance-like state. And after a few minutes, a kind of delirium would overcome the women. Some would sob, some would shriek and tear their hair, others would laugh hysterically. At the height of the delirium, Mesmer would re-enter the salon dressed in a flowing silk robe embroidered with golden flowers and carrying a white magnetic rod. Moving around the container, he would stroke and soothe the patients until calm was restored. Many women would later attribute the strange power he had on them to his piercing look, which they thought was exciting or quieting the magnetic fluids in their bodies. Within months of his arrival in Paris, Mesmer became the rage. His supporters included Marie Antoinette herself, the Queen of France, and wife of Louis XVI. As in Vienna, he was condemned by the official faculty of medicine, but it did not matter. His growing following of pupils and patients paid him handsomely. Mesmer expanded his theories to proclaim that all humanity could be brought into harmony through the power of magnetism, the concept with much appeal during the French Revolution. A cult of mesmerism spread across the country. In many towns, societies of harmony sprang up to experiment with magnetism. These societies eventually became notorious, or they tended to be led by libertines who would turn their sessions into a kind of group orgy. At the height of Mesmer's popularity, a French commission published a report based on years of testing the theory of animal magnetism. The conclusion of magnetism's effects on the body came from a kind of group hysteria and autosuggestion. The report was well documented and ruined the reputation of France. He left the country and retired. Only a few years later, however, imitators sprang up all over Europe, and the cult of mesmerism spread once again, its believers more numerous than ever. Interpretation Mesmer's career can be broken into two parts. When still in Vienna, he believed in the validity of his theory and did all he could to prove it. But his growing frustration and the disapproval of his colleagues made him adopt another strategy. First, he moved to Paris, where no one knew him and where his extravagant theories found more fruitful soil. Then he appealed to the French love of theater and spectacle, making his apartment into a kind of magical world in which a sensory overload of smells, sights, and sounds entranced his customers. Most importantly, from now on he practiced his magnetism only in a group. The group provided the setting in which the magnetism would have its proper effect, one believer infecting the other, overwhelming any individual doubter. Mesmer thus passed from being a confirmed advocate of magnetism to the role of a charlatan, using every trick in the book to captivate the public. The biggest trick of all was to play on the repressed sexuality that bubbles under the surface of any group setting. In a group, a longing for social unity, a longing older than civilization, cries out to be awakened. This desire may be subsumed under a unifying cause, but beneath it is a repressed sexuality that the charlatan knows how to exploit and manipulate for his purposes. This is the lesson that Mesmer teaches us. 
Our tendency to doubt, the distance that allows us to reason, is broken down when we join a group. The warmth and infectiousness of the group overwhelm the skeptical individual. This is the power you gain by creating a cult. Also, by playing on people's repressed sexuality, you lead them into mistaking their excited feelings for signs of your mystical strength. You gain untold power by working on people's unrealized desire for a kind of promiscuous and pagan unity. Remember too that the most effective cults mix religion with science. Take the latest technological trend or fad and blend it with a noble cause, a mystical faith, or a new form of healing. People's interpretations of your hybrid cult will run rampant, and they will attribute powers to you that you had never even thought to claim. Image, the magnet, an unseen force draws objects to it, which in turn become magnetized themselves, drawing other pieces to them, the magnetic power of the whole constantly increasing. But take away the original magnet and it all falls apart. Become the magnet, the invisible force that attracts people's imaginations and holds them together. Once they have clustered around you, no power can wrest them away. Authority, the charlatan achieves his great power by simply opening a possibility for men to believe what they already want to believe. The credulous cannot keep at a distance. They crowd around the wonder worker, entering his aura, surrendering themselves to illusion with a heavy solemnity like cattle. Greek D. Francesco, Reversal, one reason to create a following is that a group is often easier to deceive than an individual and turns over to you that much more power. This comes, however, with a danger. If at any moment the group sees through you, you will find yourself facing not one deceived soul but an angry crowd that will tear you to pieces as avidly as it once followed you. The charlatans constantly faced this danger and were always ready to move out of town as it inevitably became clear that their elixirs did not work and their ideas were sham too slow and they paid with their lives. In playing with the crowd, you are playing with fire and must constantly keep an eye out for any sparks of doubt, any enemies who will turn the crowd against you. When you play with the emotions of a crowd, you have to know how to adapt, attuning yourself instantaneously to all of the moods and desires that a group will produce. Use spies, be on top of everything, and keep your bags packed. For this reason, you may often prefer to deal with people one by one, Isolating them from their normal milieu can have the same effect as putting them in a group, it makes them more prone to suggestion and intimidation. Choose the right sucker, and if he eventually sees through you, he may prove easier to escape than a crowd.